It's good to have you here with me to worship today. Today is the last Sunday of end time. It's kind of like New Year's Eve in the church year. Next Sunday is New Year's Day, we could say, but this is the last Sunday of the church year, Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday, the first Sunday of the new church year, the first Sunday in Advent. Our order of service will begin with the service of the word that starts on page 38. We're going to begin right now with hymn number 341, Crown Him With Many Crowns. of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Thank you. 
our Old Testament reading for this Christ the King Sunday is from Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 to 16 and 23 and 24. A reading in which, oh, the Lord speaks and talks about how the kings of God's people were not doing a good job and were misleading the people and, and how he was going to send a shepherd king who would take care of the people. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, thinking of Jesus as the greater David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd, I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Alleluia. Our Lord said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alleluia. beginning at the 27th verse. This is the account of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, and Jesus speaks of himself as our king, and we see how he accomplished being our king by going to the cross, where it did say, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. 
When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down they kept watch over him there. Above his head the plate, they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Here ends our gospel lesson. Let's sing our second hymn, hymn number 217, hymn number 217. this Christ the King Sunday is our epistle reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're looking at verses 20 to 28 where the Apostle Paul said, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, 
authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Let's bow our heads for prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends who know that because Christ lives, we too shall live eternally through faith in him. You've probably all heard the story and perhaps you can remember me telling it to you. There was a, a lady who was diagnosed as being terminally ill and, and was told that she had about three months left to live. Well, when she learned that she had three months left to, dig, left to live, what she did is she got things organized in her life so that she was ready. And one thing that she did is she contacted the pastor, her pastor, and she told her pastor the hymns that she wanted sung at her funeral. She told the pastor the Bible verses that she wanted to be read at her funeral. And not sure why exactly, but she even told the pastor the outfit that she wanted to be buried in. Well, she told him all of these different things, and, and furthermore, she said that she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible. And well, then the pastor was ready to get going, but then all of a sudden, she remembered one more detail and she called to the pastor and she said to him I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand when the pastor heard that he really didn't know how to respond to that well she said to him that surprises you doesn't it pastor admitted that he was puzzled, but then she continued. In all my years of attending church socials and potluck dinners, I always remember that when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, someone inevitably would lean over and say, keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew something better was coming, like velvety chocolate cake or deep dish apple pie. So I want the people to see me in my casket with a fork in my hand, and I want them to wonder what's with the fork. Then I want you to tell them, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. Well, the pastor's eyes welled up with tears of joy when, when he heard her say that because he kind of came to realize that she had a better grasp of what was going on with death than maybe he did at that particular time. He, he looked at the circumstances and he, he thought this probably would be one of the last times that he'd get to see her, but he, he was so thankful she had such a good grasp of what death was all alike. Well, she passed away, and at her funeral and at the visitation, what happened is that, oh, the people saw her there in the casket, and, well, 
They saw her with that pretty dress on that she wanted to be buried in. They saw her favorite Bible and they saw her with that fork in her right hand. And the pastor repeatedly heard the question, what's with the fork? And all he did during the visitation time is he just, he just smiled and said nothing. But then it came time for him to preach the message at the funeral service. And then he told the people who were there about the conversation that he had had with her, or that she had with him, and what she was talking about or what she was thinking about when she asked to have that fork in her hand like that. Well, the pastor told the people that, oh, he couldn't stop thinking about what she had said and that they probably wouldn't be able to stop thinking about what that fork meant either. whole point, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. So the next time when you reach down for your fork, when you are at the dinner table, well, when you do that, remember this message, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come for anyone who is a believing child of God. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying to us today. Keep your fork, the best is yet to come. And when we hear that encouragement, what we need to recognize, of course, is that the source of our sorrow is sin. But, thankfully, the source of our joy is Christ, our Savior and our King. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's the Apostle Paul's resurrection chapter. And that chapter is one that we hear verses from it on Easter Sunday and, and at most Christian funerals. The Holy Spirit was, had inspired Paul to write these words because there was a doctrinal dispute that was going on in Corinth because there were these false teachers who were saying that there is no resurrection from the dead. And now they didn't deny that Jesus rose from the dead. They just denied that there was a resurrection of the dead of our human bodies. And what Paul stresses here to, to that false teaching is he said that if a person really believed that, if that was true, then the, our Christianity really would be worse than worse, worthless. Now, just before our text, the Apostle Paul said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. And, and thankfully, that's not the case. The Apostle Paul said, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Those who have fallen asleep are those who have died. And now Paul says, death came through a man. And we know who that man is. That man is Adam. And well, we know the place. That's the Garden of Eden. And we we know the words there as well, where God had said in that day, in the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And he said, not sleep, but die, die. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit from that tree, what they did is they died spiritually. At that moment, they were destined to eternal death in hell because of their sin, because of their rebellion, their rejection of God. And of course, because of their sin, what 
would also happen is that they would die physically and that death, it did take place for them many, many years later, but it did come. If it had been the case that they didn't rebel against God, if they didn't eat the fruit of that tree, if they hadn't rejected God as they did, what could have been the case for them is that they could have lived forever. They would not have had to have died. But as a result of their sin, well, Paul says, in Adam all die. Adam and Eve, they were created in the image of God, in his holiness, in his righteousness, his perfection. They were holy, but when they sinned, they lost that image of God, and therefore they could only give their children, their descendants, not God's image, which had been lost, but their image, their sinful image. Their sinful image. And their sin and the countless sins that have been committed in our world ever since that time, all of those sins have been the source of all of the sorrow that we have had in this world. And that's the source of our sorrow. The source of our sorrow, it's not the, the sickness, the death, the terrorists, the crime, the sluggish economy, the viruses. It's not those things that are the source of our sorrow. Those are the results of our, the results of our sin. The source of our sorrow, that's sin our sin, and, and only our sin. Thank God that we know the answer to the source of our sorrow, to, the, to our sin. When a former president of the United States was 80 years old, there happened to be a friend of his that came to visit him and shook his trembling hand and asked him this question, good morning, and how is John Quincy Adams today? The retired chief executive explained, replied that day, he himself is quite well, sir, quite well, but the house he lives in at the present, referring to his body, but the house he lives in at the present is becoming dilapidated. It is tottering on its foundation. Time and the seasons have almost destroyed it. Its roof is pretty well worn and its walls are much shattered and it crumbles a little bit more with every wind. The old tenement is becoming almost uninhabitable and I think John Quincy Adams will have to move out of it soon. But he himself is well, sir, quite well. And now see, that's the confidence that anybody who's a believing child of God can have. That's the confidence that we can have because of Christ. And it, well, wasn't long after that that John Quincy Adams ended up having his second and fatal stroke. Well, Paul said, but Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ is the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep because, well, earlier in his ministry, what Jesus had done is he had raised several people back to life. There were others that had been raised back to life, but Jesus was the first fruits from the dead because he's the first one to be raised from the dead who didn't face death again, who instead had a glorified body that would live on forever. And now, He's the first fruits, and by the grace of God through faith, we're going to follow him in that and also rise from the dead if, if we have died before 
Judgment Day, of course. And it's because of Christ's victory and because we know we're going to rise from the dead like that, that's why we can look at death and think of it as more of a sleep than of death because we know we're going to rise. Paul said, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. And the man that he's talking about there is Jesus, the God-man. And because he is the God-man, that means that his death and his resurrection has such tremendous, such amazing value that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. No one has to suffer the consequences of death that Adam and Eve had earned for us when they ate the fruit from that tree back in the Garden of Eden. Well, Paul said, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. All who have died will be raised from the dead on that last day. An amazing miracle from God. No one will be missed out on that day. No one will be overlooked, but tragically, there will be no blessing for those who are raised who had died without Christ, who had died as unbelievers, rejecting Jesus the Savior, their bodies not glorified will be raised from the dead and, well, they will face eternal punishment. Paul said, then after all the bodies have been raised, then the end will come when Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. And now here he's talking about the end of all the godless sinful rule of mankind and well of, of Satan as well over this planet. Well, Christ, who's ruling in our hearts by faith, what he's going to do is he's going to topple those who sinfully think that they are the authorities in this world. And, well, what Christ's going to do is he's going to be in control. And it talks here about how he's going to turn over his kingdom to the Heavenly Father, to the one who sent him to accomplish our salvation and to establish his, his eternal kingdom. That is the church. Every enemy of God and his people, even the last great enemy, death, as it talks about here, will have been overcome and put under Christ's feet. And, well, he says, with his mission accomplished, the Son will turn over his kingdom to God the Father and he'll reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever. Paul says, now when it says that everything has been placed under Christ's feet, it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. And now, this is a confusing passage because, well, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the triune God, they are three equal persons in this one God. They are three equal persons. However, when Jesus came into our world as the God-man, what he did is he did submit himself and put himself 
under God the Father. No, Jesus was sent by the Father, it says. And, well, Jesus was made subject to God the Father in that sense, in the sense that administratively we could say that God the Father is the one who is over all things. And now what it talks about is how Christ would accomplish his work and have everything submitted to him. But as everything submitted to him, then what he does is he turns everything over to God the Father, the administrative head over all things. And so Christ could say, I and the Father are one, meaning that they are equal. And he could also say, the Father is greater than I. And both statements are true. It depends on the perspective of what you're talking about here. It's part of the mystery and the wonder of the Trinity, something that we're never going to really fully understand or grasp, but by the grace of God, we'll just believe what the Bible says, that they're all equal, and yet there were times when Jesus put himself under the Father, but yet they're all equal. There was a, a Christian who had a secret dread of dying and he just prayed over and over to God that God would remove that fear from him. And one night he happened to be walking past a graveyard and as he was walking past that graveyard, there was this little girl who was entering the gate of the graveyard. And, and when he saw her, he asked, don't you dread crossing the cemetery alone, especially when it's so dark? The little girl looked at him and said, afraid? Oh no, my home is on the other side. Well, the man whispered to himself, I see now, Lord, I don't need to fear for the grim valley, death, is but a momentary shadow. My blessed home is just beyond. And the whole gloomy thought of dying that he was struggling with formerly so much in the course of his life, that gloom was gone and, and the source of his joy and, and the source of our joy it's Jesus, our Savior and our King. Now we live in a sinful world and, well, this sinful world has its problems and its troubles and, and we face the results of living in a sinful world. And it is so terribly troublesome at times, but, but we have Jesus our Savior King, our Shepherd King, as our Old Testament reading referred to him. And now he's ruling in our hearts right now and, and he's ruling over the kingdom of all true believers and, and he's going to rule over that kingdom that we're going to live in forever through faith in him. And because that's the fact, because that's true, you know, we can be like that dying woman that I referred to earlier who had the pastor say, keep your fork, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. But even as we say that, remember, we are so blessed right now because Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is with us. He's giving us his help and his strength. But the best is yet to come. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory, you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you, King of kings and Lord of lords, to your unending praise and glory. We pray to you, O Christ, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we gather up all other prayers we have today as we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll join in singing our prayer for our country. God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet. face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Again, it's good to have you with me to worship this Christ the King Sunday. Just a couple of announcements to share with you. Wednesday evening at 6.30, we will have our Thanksgiving Eve communion service. And remember that our Wednesday services are, are a mask required service. In the congregation this week, Tuesday, is Ron Kennedy's birthday. It is also Forrest and Karen Ripley's anniversary. I think those are the announcements I have for right now. If we don't see you or hear from you, wish you all a happy Thanksgiving, also a happy Christ the King Sunday. The Lord bless and keep you always.